Hello everyone, welcome to episode 31 of the Canberra Football Show. My name is Matt Nicoletti, joining me today is Michael Georgeski and we do have a few special guests on as well. Uh, first, Michael, how are you going today? Yeah, I'm good, thank you, Matt. Um, obviously, we've got some cup and final action to uh, to discuss, uh, some silverware being lifted, which is always uh, which is always good to see. Uh, especially at this part of the season around that sort of halfway uh, mark with the Fed Cup and the uh, FFA Cup. So, um, yeah, looking, looking forward to it. It was, There were certainly both a couple of spectacles, to say the least. And I did mention special guests. On this section of the FFA Cup qualifying section, we'll have uh, Ryan Grogan, the coach of the winning side, Tigers FC. And then in the Federation Cup, in the next section, we'll have... Nick Brosnich, uh, the winning coach of Canberra Croatia uh, Women's, and we'll also have Jeremy McGann, as always. So first, let's get straight into this matchup, Michael. It's mm-hmm. There's a lot on the line in this one, of course. Uh, since Tigers FC won, it was 5-2 to them. Calabria, Gulevsky uh, with two goals, uh, Stricker with a penalty, and Matafari with a goal. Calabria's goal was, of course, an own goal for the Monaro Panthers. And then Monaro Panthers' actual goals were Kofi Danning and Bassa Silk. Now, I mentioned this is important. That's because Tigers FC will be the club representing the ACT in the FFA Cup round of 32. This will be the second time in their history that they have entered this competition. The first time was under Jair and Gabby Wilk, where they were defeated 2-0 by Hume City in the round of 32. And fun fact for you, this is their... Of course, this is the second time they've qualified, but this is also the second only time that they've won this cup. Uh, before this okay. was named the FFA Cup Qualifying Cup, they had actually never won this cup before. They, of course, won leagues and premierships and championships, but they hadn't won this Federation Cup. So here's a list of the already qualified clubs as we record this that Tigers FC will be joining. We've got Wollongong Wolves, Blacktown City, Apia Leichhardt, Melbourne City, Sydney FC, Central Coast Mariners, Adelaide United, MacArthur FC, Brisbane Raw, Wellington Phoenix, and Western City Wanderers. That's some pretty elite uh, clubs there, Michael, that Tigers FC will be joining. Uh, Before you break down the match, how pumped will they be for this? Oh, oh, they'll they'll be massively pumped, I think. Um, Whatever club, um, you know, comes out of, you know, Canberra uh, to participate in the um, FFA Cup, you, you always hang on that. Um, that feeling and that hope that you, you can draw an A-League side. It would be great for um, for uh, Tigers FC to, to draw an A-League uh, side. We, we already know sort of the history that Canberra clubs have had when they've interacted um, and, and played against um, A-League opposition o- over the years. Um, you know, in, t- in 2014, when Melbourne Victory played um, Tuggerong United. And uh, then a couple of years later in 2016, we had Canberra Olympic we had the infamous Canberra Olympic um, Cup run where they made the semifinals uh, and, and played Sydney FC. Ultimately, when they lost, but obviously everyone around Canberra knows what a great uh, Cup run uh, that was. So hopefully, uh, in two thousand twenty-one, we can maybe uh, get, get an A League uh, opposition, which would be great for the uh, Canberra region and, and football for sure. It certainly will be, and of course, Tuggeron United made the round of 16 in their effort in the first ever season, and that Canberra Olympic effort that you're talking about was a massive run to the semifinals. Let's hope Tigers can do something similar. Michael, how did they get there? How did What was entailed in this entertaining and pretty uh, full-on matchup? Yeah, it was. It was. Um, you know, before I get into it, it there were some great goals uh, in this game. Uh, as well from both sides. So uh, we obviously had uh, Tigers FC um, get off to a hot start uh, like, like they typically do, uh, but scoring in quite bizarre uh, fashion, Matt. So, um, you know, uh, the cross came into the area uh, of the Monero Panthers box and you can see that um, Calabria is trying to do what some defenders do when they think they have time uh, in their own box and they're unsure of whether to really head the ball away or, sort of cushion it back to the goalkeeper. And it's just unfortunate because he's gone to chest it back to uh, his keeper, but um, he's chested the ball onto the post and obviously the ball's ended up in the back of the net. Um, and I mean, for that to happen in the opening sort of instances in the game, it, it, made it, 
yeah, really unfortunate. And it, you know, as a result of it, it put them on a, uh, on an uphill battle uh, f- from there. Um, certainly not the start they were looking for. And uh, Tigers doubled their advantage after a slick uh, counter-attacking move that was capped off by uh, Golevsky to make it uh, 2-0. Um, Panthers uh, responded, though, three minutes later uh, to half the deficit after a fantastic through ball. Uh, it was by Sam Haptamarium. Um, that really cut open the uh, Tigers FC defence. And then you had Danny who just cut in um, onto his right foot and just unleashed a rocket uh, into the top corner. Uh, unfortunately, uh, from an error, they couldn't um, find the equaliser and uh, actually Tigers took a 3-1 lead just before the halftime interval after Stricker converted a confident penalty uh, just off one of those nice ones where it sort of just goes off the top of the crossbar and and in to make it 3-1 at, at halftime. Um, and then Golevsky, who's a, bit, a man in form at the moment uh, at, at Tigers, uh, scored his second uh, and Tigers fourth. Uh, of the game to completely sort of break away from the, from the Panthers. Um, Monero again managed to, to get a goal back to try and make things uh, a little interesting there in the second half. Uh, it was a fantastic volley uh, from Ben Bassasilk who just let the ball come over on his right side uh, and finished into the bottom corner. Um, but uh, the Tigers had the last say. They would score the last goal in the match uh, and their fifth um, to progress to the round of 32 uh, in spectacular fashion. Um, after what looked like a, a mishit cross from Tony Matafari on the right, it kind of just, you could see it just glide over and you thought, well, this looks like it could potentially go in, maybe in and off, in off the post. And that's exactly uh, what happened um, to make it 5-2. And you could hear the crowd uh, roaring after that one. And uh, the Tigers FC players were ecstatic, obviously. Um, as it confirmed uh, their victory. Uh, I will add, um, Monero, as uh, Sam Haptamarian picked up uh, an injury uh, uh, and we, we saw the impact of that. And hopefully, um, you know, he has a speedy uh, and, um, and quick uh, recovery. This is my general thoughts on the match before we bring out, uh, we bring in Ryan. I thought, uh, yeah, it's, it's never a good uh, way to start that match. So Monero would have been kicking themselves that they uh, let in an own goal like that. Very unfortunate. Like you said, uh, in terms of Tigers, though, they were fantastic on the counter, very efficient. The way that you can see, if, if anyone go watch the highlights, if you haven't seen the match, just one, two, three quick passes and they're already in the goals. Some of those goals were brilliant. Uh, the Matafari one, like you mentioned, it seemed like a cross, but it was great technique, uh, regardless whether he tried to finish it or not, uh, or whether he meant it to be a cross. Yeah. Golevsky, two of those goals were from some of the best counterattacks in that matchup. In terms of Monaro, they they just they played a lot. Probably their best half was that first half. Uh, Kofi Danning, I thought, probably had his best game in a Monaro Panthers jersey. Not only was he great going forward, scored that great goal, but uh, he put in some fantastic defensive work in that matchup. Sam Rossbach, and once again, was crucial in mid in midfield, keeping that defensive shape when they could, and also moving forward. Unfortunately for them, sometimes when he moved forward, uh, sometimes when he moved forward, the rest of the team. Uh, didn't have uh, the same sort of uh, quickness in terms of breaking like that. So those were two of the standout players, in my opinion. Overall, though, they'll be a bit disappointed, but they can't dwell on it. They have an important uh, league run. Because there was a large portion of the match, probably 20, 30 minutes, where the match got a bit scrappy. That's when Sam Abdomerium got uh, injured. It just seemed like tit for tat in terms of in terms of fouls and whatnot. And the match seemed like it was just going astray. You can even hear on commentary a bit... Um, Steve Forshaw sort of mentioning uh, quite a bit. So the ref sort of just let the game play out, but um, it sort of got to the point where everyone would just sort of try and fouling each other until, um, until Tigers scored again. Then it was good to see the sort of match stop being a bit scrappy like that because it, it yeah. seemed like at one point, you know, that was going to happen. Ryan Grogan, coach of Tigers FC is joining us now. Ryan, first of all, congratulations. And just what's the general feeling like before we get into it? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um... Obviously, the feeling with, uh, with myself and the boys is that we're elated uh, with the result. Um, but before we get started, I just want to say thank you to Monero um, for the, uh, the opposition that they put forward the other night, um, how competitive it was. It was good to see Frank back on the sideline, in particular after his recent health, uh, health scare, um, and, and the Monero fans as well. So they had to the, the night the other night, um, even if the majority of the sound coming out of him was booing towards us. 
um, and made it actually feel like a, a real cup final. So um, kudos to Manero and, and thanks for the game. Yeah, kudos to both sets of fans. It really felt like it, it felt similar to like the uh, the MPL two final last year between Wagga and Ugali, where where they, that was like the first match where everyone was allowed to sort of bring full crowds. It's it's good to see that sort of uh, those crowds back in that regard. So before we get into the questions from the match, Ryan, I just there's a few questions I just wanted to ask you about the stuff before the match, which we found out on the day. First of all, Nathan Magic made his return after his injury against West Canberra a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so when you got the scans and the results and you realized it wasn't going to be as serious as initially thought, was this always the end goal? Yeah. So obviously after the Ugali game the other week, because um, as I said in the interview last week, we had a few knocks and stuff within the site. Um, so the timeline was always to try and get the, as many of our players back as possible for the cup. So as I alluded to in the last interview as well, we had to make some decisions in that Croatia game, sort of uh, protect some players. Uh, to make sure that we could field as strong a team as possible um, on Saturday night. And that uh, that had to do the same with uh, Julian Borgner and Nick Popovich as well, both sort of coming off with uh, a few strains in previous uh, weeks beforehand. Yep, same as Jake Kelly, uh, same as Jared Tanini, um, obviously Magic Zankful, Luke Dark coming off concussion. Uh, yeah, we had, we had some uh, issues to deal with. Let's get into some of the questions from the first half. It was a very entertaining first half, especially from a neutral's point of view. An old, an own goal from Manara, of course, gave you an advantage early on. Did this? Do you feel this sort of played into your hands in terms of uh, your play? You were able to immediately do what you guys can do best, which is use your pace and skill on the counter. Yeah, to an extent. So obviously, in terms of the way that we envisioned it starting, um, obviously scoring in the first couple of minutes, you, you can't ask for a much better start than that. Even though, obviously, he's at the expense of a Calabria mistake, um, and as obviously we feel for him. Um, to a certain extent, but at the same time, um, yeah, it was good to settle the nerves a little bit. However, I think throughout that first half and something that we spoke about at halftime, so you just alluded to like playing with a bit of freedom. I think particularly in that first half, we played with a little bit too much freedom at times. Um, some of the decisions we were making on the ball, some of the flicks and tricks and, and, and bits of street football that we were trying to implement in wrong areas. Uh, we turned over the ball unnecessarily a number of times. We put ourselves under pressure in that first half and particularly that first half an hour. Um, Monero had spent a fair bit of time in our uh, defensive half. Um, they just didn't create much with it, you know what I mean? And until that that second goal, which for me is uh, my favourite goal of the night, that, that the, the breakaway, uh, um, I think after the second goal is when we actually really settled. That was part of my question I was going to ask, in, especially in that first half when Monero had the ball quite a bit and they scored, and that was probably their best uh, section of the match. How do they make it hard for you in those areas, sort of uh, holding up to possession for quite a while? Yeah, so what was impressive about Monero and their attacking half um, is the patience that they showed in trying to break us down. Um, there were a few nervy moments there, like Luke Darks cleared one off the line. I think it's kind of, that's come from Dominici. He split our defence. Uh, got in behind. Uh, so Luke, you saved their bacon there. Um, and there's a few other half chances that they they sort of created. Um, and I think we, we copped three corners in a row as well um, there for the period. But then again, it was, I think, off that third corner is when we broke um, and hit them on the counter to get that second goal. Um, and then yeah, from there, I think we started to re regain a bit of ascendancy in the game and we were a bit, a bit calmer on the ball. Um, and yeah, the, the goal uh, with Kofi Danning, I think was an example of us being a little bit too flamboyant on the ball. So the turnover or, or, um, on the far side from the bench, um, I think from Donny. You know, I mean, he's tried to let it roll through his legs. They've picked it off. They found Kofi. Kofi's nailed it, um, which sort of added a bit more spice to it. But then obviously the penalty towards the end of the half um, gave us that breathing space again going into half time. Yeah, Ryan, obviously, uh, first I just want to say congratulations uh, for, the, for the result. Um, so you, you just touched on it there. Uh, going into the second half, uh, you'd obviously just scored the third goal uh, from Stricker from the penalty spot, um, gaining mo real momentum uh, there. What was the game plan heading into the second half just after you'd scored that third goal to give yourselves a bit of uh, breathing space? Yeah, so at half time, um, as I just said before, my messages were aimed around just keeping it simple um, and eliminating the unnecessary turnovers. So we... We knew, obviously, um, and it sounds pretty silly, but again, it's something you need to say. You're two goals up in at half time. If you don't concede in the second half, we're taking the trophy on. So it was more about just um, shoring up our defensive side. So the way that the Kofi goal was conceded, um, apart from the mistake with the turnover, 
um, our defensive structure in our de defensive transition wasn't uh, it wasn't flowing the way it should have. So we were playing with two sixes. Uh, one of our, one of our sixes weren't dropping into the back line in transition, uh, which ended up with Christian Jono, who's playing as our right back, ended up playing as centre back. That's why Kofi had so much space out in the left side. So we rectified that in the second half. Um, I think you can see in the second half, you see Nathan Magic dropping into that centre half role with Griffo, um, which gave us a lot more solidarity and, and a lot safer at the back defensively. Um, and then, yeah, again, um, we scored, what, the fourth one, very similar to the first one in terms of how it was produced. You know, I mean, cut back, finished with Joshi. Um, and then what was the best of Silks scored that banger with 10 to go as well, uh, which put a, a few nerves in us. But then, I don't know, what can you say about Matt Fari's goal? You know what I mean? That's just just perfect way to end it. Absolutely. And I, I want to go off um, Josh Kolevsky there. Obviously, he's he scored a brace uh, in this game. Um, you know, um, I think, can, can you just talk a little bit about his uh, progression uh, this season? Certainly uh, recently, um, you know, he's got four goals now in, in his last three games. How, how have you made um, of, how, of how he's come along, um, considering the, you know, at the start of the season, he necessarily wasn't fine in the back of the net, but it really seems as though he's um, starting to find his feet under your team now. Yeah, so over the first course, uh, the first month of the season, uh, Joshi was finding himself in the right positions. He just wasn't converting. Um, and I think at different times, and again, I said in the interview last week, um, after the Belconnor game, we had a bit of a think um, about what needs to happen in terms of the being clinical in the final third. Um, Joshi has come into his own in the last couple of weeks, and particularly with Popper, uh, with the injuries, so we've been able to push Joshi a little bit further forward, and he's, he's doing a fantastic job now. He's, he's playing with confidence. Um, the team as a unit, uh, the more they play together, the more the nonverbal communication um, is becoming stronger. You know what I mean? So they're, they're understanding where each other are without actually having to tell each other where they are. And Josh is just getting into the right areas and he's, he's finishing with a plan. Absolutely. And lastly, for the, for the second half, um, I want to get onto that Tony Matafari uh, goal that really, um, obviously it was the fifth goal of the game. You know, it comes sort of like right at the end. Obviously, everyone's going crazy. Yeah, it was a it was a absolute banger of a goal. Um, it it actually made the FFA Cup uh, social uh, page as well, which is uh, great to see. I mean, what did you make of that finish? I mean, ha, ha, did he have a conversation with you and tell you that he actually did mean it, or? Yeah, first thing he said, he <laughs> came off. He goes, I saw him off his line. I saw him off his line. Of course, I meant it um, <laughs> from my angle. Obviously, on the on the near side, I had my doubts. Uh, but then again, having a look at it on the on the camera. You know I mean, there wasn't much he was aiming for in the middle. So maybe he wasn't meaning that, you know what I mean? And he's, he's to be fair against you, Gali, he did something similar. Um, and we, we took the mickey out of him a little bit in that game as well, saying oh, it's, it's a cross gone wrong. Um, he's pretty confident that he was having a shot. And I suppose he's just, he's proved myself wrong. And I'll give it to him. He, he claimed it and he's executed it. And it's perfect, man. Big game, big goal. Yeah, no, I agree. Because when I, the more I watch that goal, the more I think actually it does, you know, it, the more I... I see it. I'm looking at it going, yeah, he looks like he's about to cross it. But when he goes for the shot, it it, it looks more like a shot than when I saw it because I was sitting behind your bench. So I saw a similar angle. But yeah, yeah regardless, it was great, a great strike in that regard. Yeah, it was a ripper. And uh, just moving on to more of the the aftermath of the of the result. Um, obviously, you had some great support uh, on the day from your from your fans, uh, which you could which you could really see, uh, especially for the last. Uh, two goals uh, and the celebrations there. How, how great was that uh, to see uh, as a coach to sort of have, have your fans there uh, on, on a big day for the club? Yeah, it's fantastic. You know what I mean? It's like having a, an extra player. All these cliches are cliches for a reason. Um, and I think it's the first time in 18 months where we've had a proper crowd um, at a football match. You know what I mean? So it, you'd sort of get a little bit accustomed to like the COVID season last year and even like the first few rounds of this year. Um, the crowds haven't been uh, massive, but then all the hype around it being a cup final, it was it's made more special by being able to share it with s such a big crowd. Absolutely. Uh, obviously, 5-2 uh, result, which which was fantastic. You're now in the um, FFA Cup round of 32, which is an amazing uh, achievement. Um, did you say anything to the squad um, post-match uh, in, the, in the sheds or did you sort of just let them have that time to, to celebrate um which approach did you did you take did you have a chat to them after um 
normally I don't say much in the sheds after a game, whether it's a win or a loss, um, because I like to save my thoughts for our next training session, um, because I understand that the view that I have on the sideline is only one view, and I get sucked into the emotion of the game. Um, so I, send, I tend to go back, rewatch the game a couple of times before I give my true thoughts on the game. But even if I'd wanted to say something in that change room after the game, there was no chance of me saying anything with the way they were going on. <laughs> Love that. Matt? Yeah, so thanks for coming on, Ryan. In general, the way, considering the way your team play, and I just thought uh, during the match, your counterattacks especially were terrific. Like you mentioned, your favourite goals were that. I guess my last question before you head off is, would you say that's uh, probably the best uh, quality of your side? Uh, using your speed well, using the skill well, one, two, three touches very quickly and you're in the, you're in the opponent's box. Yeah. So obviously with the team that we've assembled, we, we, we need to identify what your strengths are. Um, with the front line that we have and particularly the front five that we play with, whatever that combination looks like, we know we've got an abundance of pace. Um, so it just makes a little bit of sense. I mean, where we focus a fair bit on transition um, and how we break forward. I think Steve said it in the in the broadcast. He was yeah. he could see um, some of the things we were doing, offset pieces where we're leaving players out in in certain areas, um, and particularly that second goal paid dividends. You know what I mean? So, what was it? Lockie broke, uh, releases Joshy. That ball from Joshy into Jay is just next level. Um, but Joshy continues his run. So it's from one from the back end, from one side of the pitch to the other side of the pitch, the cut back finish. It's all within two or three touches. It's just yeah. I mean, it's something that Ant and I have spoken about a number of times since Saturday night because it's just, it's, yeah, it's what we, what we plan for. And what are you looking forward to most in terms of being on the national stage? Um, just the occasion, you know what I mean? It, it's, I've had obviously a lot of people have asked me, who do you want to play next? You know what I mean? And, and having a look at the teams that have already qualified um, and the teams that can potentially qualify, I don't think it matters who we have next. I think whoever it is, it's going to be a good game. It's going to be a big occasion. Um, and it's something that until the draw is done, um, I think we need to put to the back of our mind a little bit and focus on the MPL. But once it comes around and whoever the opponent is and wherever we're playing, it's, it's just going to be amazing. Amazing for the players, amazing experience for everyone involved. It certainly will be. And we are all going to be looking forward to that. Congratulations once again. And thank you for joining us, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. No worries, boys. Thanks for having me. Now, moving on to the Federation Cup uh, final, uh, obviously the second uh, piece of silverware that was up for grabs on the day. Uh, we had Canberra, Croatia, ultimately win the Federation Cup final, uh, winning 4-1. Um, we had Palombi score a hat-trick and Jones also get on the score sheet for Croatia, uh, whilst uh, Chereva uh, got... Uh, on the score sheet for West Canberra Wanderers in their only goal uh, of the game. Um, this was uh, Canberra Croatia's first uh, women's uh, cup triumph in their history. So uh, a, a huge congratulations uh, to Nick uh, Brosnich and the, and the club uh, on a monumental day. Um, West Canberra ha have never won it also. Uh, so they were hoping to, to put their name onto the cup for the first time as well. So there was obviously a lot at stake uh, history-wise uh, in, in this one, uh, and it was Canberra Croatia who ultimately uh, came out on top. Uh, obviously, we have Jeremy McGahn with us, uh, as always, to break down these uh, women matches, uh, and now we're going to be uh, delving into the Federation Cup final. So, Jeremy, uh, how did this one play out from your eyes? Look, it was a great final to start with. It was a really good game to call with, with Russ Gibbs uh, on Bar TV at Deakin uh, this weekend, and we saw Matt at the game as well. Um, it, it was, you know, on paper, it, it looked like it was Canberra Croatia's final to lose uh, when you know that West Canberra was missing such a crucial piece as Tiana Jaber. Um, so on, on paper, and, and we said that before the game, we expected Canberra Croatia to win. On the field, it wasn't um, that easy. There was a lot of opportunities for Canberra Croatia to score in the first half even after they scored the first goal, uh, which was a bit of a lucky goal. Uh, but um, West Canberra fought, fought the fight, really played well, really defended uh, well, uh, and then found a way to level the game in the first half. And, and from there on, you know that with West Canberra, anything can happen. They're really good defensively. And in transition, um, they can be really fast. Uh, unfortunately for them, um, middle of the second half, the pressure for Canberra Croatia was just a little bit 
too much. Uh, I, I know that the, the second goal is somewhat um, controversial, especially in the eyes of uh, West Canberra players and, and supporters. Uh, but what we've seen from Canberra Croatia is that they never stop. They keep bringing their firepower up front. And when in the second half, you're able to bring in somebody like Chantal Jones, who's um, you know probably as good or better than any of the forwards that you have on the field, uh, it, it speaks to the armada that Nick has um, playing for him. Uh, and and you know they never stop for the whole 90 minutes, just attack and attack and attack and attack. And eventually, this is going to pay unless like we've seen the week before against the academy, unless there's an amazing goalkeeper in front of him who's doing miracles, uh, or if he really doesn't want to get in. Uh, but yeah, it was it it was dominated by Canberra Croatia. That was a very good final to watch, and there was a very good West Canberra team in front of him. Uh, but I think Canberra Croatia will ultimately deserve the victory, even though four one is a bit of a of a harsh result when you see what, how the game was. Joining us now is Nick Brosnich, coach of the winning side Canberra Croatia. Nick. Thanks for joining me today. And first of all, congratulations. Thanks. Uh, thank you very well much. Done, uh, man. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on. Now, let's start uh, with uh, some of the questions I have from the first half. Uh, you guys scored early, of course. How important was that to sort of set the pace for the game and try and open up West Canberra defensively, considering you guys conceded, you know, sort of similar an early goal against CUA only, you know, the week prior? Yeah, look, we um we touched on that very much so throughout the week leading up to to the game. Um, we knew we were going to be in for uh, a defensively based opponent against us. We've come up against that uh, pretty often over the last few weeks within the competition. So we stressed on the importance of trying to get the early goal, trying to open up the game a little bit and, and make it a bit more free flowing. Um, we got that, um, which was good. Unfortunately, we conceded again um, um, midway through the first half. So it did make it a bit, bit cagey again. Um, but yeah, yeah, we did. We really stressed on the importance of, of scoring that early goal. And Jeremy, this one's for you. A lot of chances, like Nick mentioned, there came thick and fast for the sorry against West Canberra. They were able to sort of hold off until that equaliser. Uh, how much character did they show in, in terms of staying in there despite you know the mounting pressure? Yeah, I think, you know, we, we know the Armada, the offensive Armada of, of Canberra Croatia, like we discussed just before. Uh, and when when you're West Canberra and when you don't have technically, supposedly your most experienced defender, Jenna Jeber, it's even harder. But you had players in there, Sarah Whitfield to name her, that were here two years ago when they lost 6-0 against Balconen. And so those players probably stressed into their teammate the importance of knowing that you're facing a team that is so powerful offensively that you're going to have to defend and you're going to have to defend well and you're going to have to fight every single of those balls. You know, Canberra Croatia had some um, very open opportunity. Um, Olivia Fogarty and Jimmy Berkeley probably could have scored one in the first half. Uh, but West Canberra never stopped. And, uh, you know, the, the coach uh, was leading by example. I don't know how many tackles Emma Stenberg had done on the edge of the box, uh, but she prevented Canberra Croatia from um, shooting probably six or seven times in very dangerous positions. Um, so you, when, you, when you're when technically the underdog, you have to defend that hard. When you're playing against Canberra Croatia, if you've watched all the other games, you know that that's what you have to do and, and you have to make sure that you're as well ready to attack in transition afterwards, which is what West Canberra did well. And Nick, coming into the second half, what was the team talk like at halftime going in 1-1? Yeah, look, the halftime talk was was primarily really positive. Um, we went in um, and we had a chat about about how the how the half unfolded, and it was a it was a really positive vibe. You know, we knew that we were playing a really positive brand of football. We were playing and executing the game plan we put in place really well. Um, there was a little bit of of discussion around being clinical and finishing and taking opportunity um, or putting away the opportunities that we do create because they were there in the first half. Um, but also leading into the back end of that first half, um, you know, started to get a little bit, a little bit frantic. You know, um, I think the girls thought that um, they, they needed to take more out of that first half. But there was just a stress on staying calm that, you know, continuing playing the football that we're playing in that first half and the opportunities would come and, and would finish them eventually. Um, but, yeah, it was primarily a positive message because I believe that first half was, was really good. But bouncing back on what you're saying, Nick, how did you feel when, you know, midway through the first half, uh, we see West Canberra all of a sudden defensive a little bit higher. And instead of waiting for you in their last 20, they started going to press you in your own half. And then that's when, like you say, it looked a bit panicky defensively. And, you know, they score one just before there's that 
foul that, that's a bit of bidding, but regardless, they score just after. It looked like they definitely had the opportunity to, to take the game in. How do you what do you tell your girls at that moment? Yeah, like I said, it was just a matter of you know sticking to what we what we what we thought was going to happen in the game. We knew they were going to set up defensively. We knew there would be swings in momentum in the football game as it always does. And it's a matter of being aware and being able to adjust um, throughout a game and deal with those situations. Um, I think in, in that point in the game, we'd been, we'd been on the front foot attacking for, for 20, 30 minutes in the football game. And then we conceded um, to, to come back to one all. And, um, you know, that's a situation, you know, that, that doesn't feel good in football because, because you feel like you've created a, a large number of chances. You haven't been able to take them to a degree and then you concede. Um, but it's a matter of, of how they pick themselves up in that situation and get themselves reset and being able to move on. And it took us five or 10 minutes there in that, in that little block that you're mentioning where, where Woden picked up a little bit of momentum and they were able to play forward and play a bit more of a positive brand of football um, in our half and, and, and get into our final third a few times. Um, I think we dealt with it primarily fairly well. Um, but yeah, it's just a matter of when, when those moments happen. And that, that was a part of the halftime talk as well, being able to just manage yourselves, calm everything down um, and, and start playing your brand of football again. And Nick, we've mentioned how before how much it helps that you're able to bring on someone like Chantel Jones, someone with a lot of experience, a lot of strength, a lot of power and good skill as well. Uh, when she uh, came on during the match, did you feel it sort of helped to break down the West Canberra defence, who at that point were probably at their strongest defensively before that goal. Yeah, bringing on someone like Chantel Jones, um, you know, is huge. You know, she's she she has a the ability to unsettle an opponent just just by her her mere presence. You know, she's she's some she's physical. She has a huge presence on the field. She's somewhat intimidating when she's on the field, and and just having her and her presence come off the bench, you know, it's huge, and it does it does affect the shape. It does affect the the way an opponent plays against you. Um, and you know, on top of that, she's she's a brilliant footballer. She's got every attribute you you'd want to have as a footballer. She's skillful. She can she can shoot. Um, she's physical. She can win challenges, and you know all those things. Not only unsettle the opponent, but but having that on the pitch lifts your team and and takes them to another gear and, and allows them to to play a more of a free flowing brand of football around her. And Brittany Plomby with a hat trick today. I heard Jeremy say and uh, Russ say on commentary the right foot, and I was in the box at the time, and the, it seemed like the majority of the people, uh, the Canberra Crash supporters in the box, were saying the same thing: the right foot, uh, in general. But yeah, how 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 great was she uh, that day? Of course, scoring a hat trick. Yeah, look, Britt Palombi, she's she's an out and out goal scorer. You know, she's she's the the dreams the dream striker that everybody wants to be able to have up front in their team. Um, you know, but it's really difficult for an opposition to play with Brittany Palombi in your team, or especially in our team, because you know, if if you focus yourself on defending Brittany Palombi, there's there's another six or seven goal scorers around her in Grace Gill, Krista Hagen, Jamie Berkeley, Olivia Fogarty, as we mentioned, Chantel Jones, Jenny Bissett. You know, so you don't have the ability as an opposition um, to focus on trying to mark her out of the game because there's so many threats elsewhere. But I reckon she scored more with her right than her left this year. She's having, she's having a good season Jeremy with her. With, that. Yeah, she? she's having a good season with her right foot. I think she's got yeah. four, five with her right. Five out of what? Is that 13, 14 now? Yeah, 33% um, on her right foot. She'll take that. For sure. It's also, I think, well, we don't have the stats from like before 2011, but that's the first time. Um, somebody scores a hat trick in the Fed Cup final. Uh, we were we were mentioning everybody who scored a who got a brace, but she, she's the first hat trick. What I thought was amazing as well from from Brit is that during that second half, and again I think I said it during the broadcast, we we forget about her. She she was having o- almost an average second half where she's a bit less um, present. She didn't touch a lot of the ball, but that's how good she is. She she tends to. I guess make herself forgotten, and then when she needs to be in the box at the reception of a of a cross, then she's going to be here and she's going to put it in the back of the net. Yeah, and that's what that's that's what all the best strikers in the world do. You know, they they don't have to be the focal point of a team. They don't have to be have the ball at their feet all the time. It's just when the opportunity arises, um, she's lethal and, and she'll bury them. I mean, you know, we we've played around a little bit this season with playing her on the left side and the right side of our, of our front three and. Um, 
as you said, you know, she's scored five on her right foot almost out of out of the, the fact that she's had to because I, I played her on that side, wanting her to cut in on her left, but the opportunities fall to her right and she's proved that she can just be as lethal um, on both feet this year. Nick, uh, Michael here, obviously congratulations uh, on the result uh, Thanks, and man. lifting the trophy. Um, what's I, I just want to know, what's the feeling at, at, at the club like uh, after winning the one trophy that's sort of eluded um, your team? Yeah, it's good. And, you know, like we, we made a uh, – well, so we had a goal-setting session at the start of the year about, you know, what we wanted to achieve this year and, and what we thought was capable in this team um, coming off the back of, of such a promising and successful year last year. Um, and, you know, one of the primary things that we wanted to do was to make the Fed Cup final and, and, and to win the Fed Cup. And that was our first goal of the season and we did it. We knew that it was a, it was a trophy that, that we hadn't won yet. Um, hence the importance that we put behind winning that one this year. Um, I believe it's the only trophy that we hadn't won as a club as well, not just in the women's program. So we have a full trophy cabinet now at the club, which is really nice. <laughs> that's, a, that's always a, an added bonus for sure. Um, can you just speak a little bit about sort of the, the changes that, that have gone on um, at, at the club over the last couple of years? I know it's something that um, you've wanted to chat about uh, for, for a bit. Yeah, look, um, you know, I've had the pleasure at this club of, of coaching throughout all the junior teams as well as coming into the senior team now. And I've had the opportunity, you know, to work with, with girls through all the age groups and to, you know, put my philosophy um, and, and your football style um, um, throughout all the teams, which is nice, and um, also be able to pass that on to all the other coaches. You know, we've made a, we've made a big effort over the last few years to put expectations in, um, in our program um, from a playing standpoint and what we expect of our players and holding a high standard, um, you know, from, from training to, to game day and, and just, just some strict regiments behind how we approach training, game day and all that sort of stuff. Um, and, you know, it's, it's paid dividends. You know, the, the girls know what, where they stand, what their expectations are, you know, if they're playing, if they're not playing, how they need to present themselves and work. And, and you know, it's, it's really sort of started to show itself over the last few years in the success that the program's having. Absolutely. That, that's great to hear. And I, I suppose after the full-time whistle, um, obviously in that moment and in, in that circumstance, after, after just winning a trophy, I mean, did you have time to um, have a chat to the girls about, about the result or was it just pretty much cel cel celebrations and no real, no real time for, for talk? Yeah, look, no, we, we, I decided to leave the talk um, for tomorrow night at training. Um, you know, we let the girls enjoy themselves. Um, you know, we obviously had the trophy presentation. Then we just went back to the club and had a few had a few drinks and had a bit of a celebration. After the men's FFA Cup final, the club representatives came down and joined us as well. And we had a nice meal and a few drinks together. And, you know, we'll touch base and, and, and break the game down um, on Tuesday night at training tomorrow and going into the weekend's game. Yeah, and just talking about uh, the weekend's game, obviously uh, back into league action now um, against your, uh, you know, uh, close competitor in uh, West Canberra Wanderers. Um, how do you expect uh, that clash uh, to, to differ? Yeah, look, obviously um, they're going to be hurting from a grand final. Um, nobody likes to, to lose a game, let alone, let alone lose in a grand final after having such a really good run throughout the qualifying for that grand final, you know, they've, they've improved huge amounts over the last few weeks and had a really good run going into, into the Fed Cup final. So, you know, they're going to have a lot spurring them on in, into the game on the weekend. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll just refocus. We'll, we'll come out with a game plan. Look, it's probably going to be a very similar type of football game as to what we saw on Friday night, sorry, on Saturday lunchtime rather. Um, but yeah, it's just going to be a matter of, you know, who can apply themselves at best and bounce back from that, you know, um, would like to carry on that form, form and perform that way again. But, you know, there's going to be a different reaction from, from Woden. They're going to be hurting coming off that loss and we need to be ready for that. Uh, Jeremy, do you have any last questions for Nick? Uh, j just maybe talking a little bit about the, the rest of the season, I guess, with the, uh, the objective obviously being into at least the semifinal. Um, a player that impressed me this weekend was uh, Rene Juna. I thought she had uh, a wonderful game as a fullback. And we spoke at the beginning of the season, you and me, Nick, about the, the plethora of talent that you have this season uh, and that it's going to be somehow challenging to find your starting eleven when you have so much talent. 
We saw Amy McLaughlin coming back onto the bench this weekend after missing quite a few games. Um, how are you going to manage that between, you know, Rene, Lara, Agnew, uh, and then obviously center back, you're going to have um, Amy with Cecilia and, and Rhea as well? Yeah, look, um, I guess it's it's a good problem to have, but it's also it's, it's a difficult situation to deal with sometimes in, in managing players, but it's a part of coaching and part of, of managing football teams. Um, like I said just earlier, you know, we've we've put in expectations of our players throughout the year and, you know, from training attendance to performance to attitude and, and, and application, you know, all those things we take into consideration when, where, when we select our team on the weekend. So it's going to come down to them really as to as to who who makes the starting 11 um but yeah on on Renee Juno that you just mentioned there she's she's a brilliant footballer um you know she's been super impressive this year and you know her attitude and application is is second to none in the team and to have that at such a young age um coming into a, a squad of players who have a huge amount of experience and to to just move into that team seamlessly and do such a good job is huge for her I wouldn't be surprised if you see her on a, on a bigger stage at some point. And to cap it off, uh, Nick, my question is, did the club get a full-size replica trophy or just the little one like last time? No, no, no. We got a big, we got the, we got the big trophy <laughs> this year. We got the big one this year. So for people who don't know that last year, they said due to COVID, um, the Campbell Crusher men's and women's teams, instead of getting like a, a decent size replica, they got a, a miniature one. <laughs> And then the and then someone from the uh, board responded to me with, "Well, we don't have enough room anyway, so I guess it works out." <laughs> but, but, in, but in saying that, this big one doesn't hold drinks very well. <laughs> <laughs> it held held the medals all right though, from the photos I saw from uh, Sal. So say that again. Uh, the it holds medals okay though, because they put the medals. It does. In it there. does. It does. They don't fall through the cracks. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Nick and Jeremy. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, thanks, man. Congratulations again, Nick. Uh, enjoy Great. the win. Congrats. Thanks, man. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Well done. Congrats. Awesome. Great having the likes of Ryan Grogan and Nick Brosnich on the show. And of course, always great having Jeremy McGann on the show. Uh, is there anything you take out of those interviews with uh, Ryan and Nick? Um, obviously, two uh, great guys, uh, two very good uh, coaches in. Uh, Canberra football uh, obviously massive congratulations to the both of them for picking up some silverware at this point uh, in the season and we'll see later on if they can double up uh, in the trophy cabinet or not so um, we'll, we'll just see how the rest of the season plays out but I think from a coach's perspective I think those two will be very pleased with how uh, their teams ultimately performed and were able to get the result. They certainly will be. All right, Michael, thanks for joining me today. It was a different uh, departure, only, you know, preview, uh, only reviewing uh, two matches instead of 12 or something like that. But yeah, uh, we went a little more in-depth than we usually do. So it was, a, it was a good change for us. Yep, uh, always open to change. And it's, it's always good to mix up the format that's every it. now and again. So. Look, little, little hard, though, when we're reviewing 12 matches around. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's right. That would be sitting there forever. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Episode 31, FFA Cup qualifying final review and Federation Cup final review. Thank you very much and see you next week for our round nine review. Thank you. <laughs>